Hey everyone, and welcome back. Today we'll be going through some high yield stroke syndromes. So we'll talk about the neuroanatomy, which neuroanatomy is hard. We'll talk about how to localize lesions in neuroanatomy and strokes. And then we'll talk about, in addition to localizing, how to find the blood vessel and choose the right answer on your stroke questions when you're studying for exams. So we'll start with some basic principles. So each region is responsible for bodily, sensory, and motor functions. So each region has a specific sensory or motor function that it performs, and each region of the brain requires blood vessels. So we'll sort of connect those concepts together and help us understand how to answer these questions. So the core concept I want you to understand to get these stroke questions right on your NBME exams. You think of the blood supply, and when you lose that blood supply, it leads to ischemia. That ischemia leads to the damage which the functional damage to the regions of the brain is what leads to the patient presentation. So we'll sort of work backwards from patient presentation, which is what you'll see on your questions. You work backwards through the damage to the ischemia to the blood supply. So you basically can get every pathway of these questions right and have sort of a framework for how to understand them in the future. So we'll start with the circle of Willis and some blood vessel anatomy. So each region of the brain is perfused by a blood vessel. And so we'll focus for the cortex, which is sort of the main regions of the brain. We'll focus on the main three, which are the anterior communicating, or sorry, the anterior cerebral, the middle cerebral, and the posterior cerebral. You can see the anterior cerebral goes through the middle portions of the front part of the brain. The middle cerebral goes basically to everything in the middle and the posterior cerebral heads towards the back. And then towards the end of the video, we'll also focus on the brain stem, which is supplied by, as you can see there, a combination of um, the vertebral, basilar, and posterior cerebral branches, branches as well. So keep this in mind, and we'll use this more as we localize our lesions here. So when we talk about lesion localization, the reason that this exists in the first place is because each region of the brain that performs a function sends information either through motor nerves or back through sensory nerves to perform functions like moving your hands, any sort of function. So the way that our body sort of groups these functions is based on the region of the brain. So if you look on the left side here, you see that what's called the homunculus. So basically different portions of the brain supply different regions of your limbs. So towards the middle, which if you can see here, the middle portion of the brain, which is the same section of the brain as this, basically where the hemispheres are touching each other is the leg. And as you move further and further out, you start moving down upwards to your limb. So you start with your leg, you have your arms, and then your face is the last part on the most lateral aspect here of the cortex. So the homunculus is going outwards. And so the reason this is, in simple terms, is the fibers start here, they go down, they descend through the brainstem, and then they cross over to the limbs on this side of the body. So the limbs on this side of the body are typically, the function is determined by the opposite side's hemisphere. And then we keep in mind that it's legs, then arms, then face as the distribution. So whatever region would go out would be what limb was affected on the opposite side of the body. So we won't talk about the specific brainstem regions or anything in this video for simplicity's sake, but just remember that nerves typically cross over to reach your limbs. And you can see that the vascular territories here are shown in this image. So the anterior cerebral kind of performs this front and middle region of the brain. The lateral aspect of the hemispheres is controlled by the middle cerebral and then the back part and then some middle structures are also performed by the posterior cerebral arteries. So these will be important for the syndromes that we'll talk about next because there are some high yield syndromes with each of these three arteries and we'll talk about how to get these questions right. So the first one we'll talk about is anterior cerebral artery. So that's highlighted here in yellow. It goes through the middles of the hemisphere and you can see in different, different regions. It basically is this, this part which corresponds with this part which also corresponds with this cross section. So I'm basically showing three different cross sections that you can use here. So the symptoms that you'll commonly see are contralateral sensory and motor loss in the lower extremity. So you'll see ACA is leg, leg syndromes. And the reason being is because of the homunculus. So the cross section that the ACA is responsible for is this cross section here, which is predominantly legs. And so if you see the opposite leg in a syndrome, in a stroke, it's probably the ACA 
but remember if the if the right aca has a stroke the fibers cross over and it would be my left leg and vice versa the left aca would cross over in the brainstem and it would be the right leg so remember it's the opposite leg and it's both sensory and motor but if you want some extra hints to make you feel better about this sometimes the question is a little vague it can be hard to tell there's some high yield hints that you want to keep in mind as well so you can also see emotional disturbances you lose some of your your basically frontal cortex's ability to control your emotions. And so you can potentially have emotional disturbances and then urinary incontinence is particularly high yield. The frontal micturition center is located in this region. So in some individuals, they will also, in addition to having lower extremity symptoms, you can also have loss of urine. So if you see those things in a test question in a stroke, remember anterior cerebral artery. And remember that just based on what region the blood vessel perfuses, how the brain supplies each limb, and then you can basically track backwards to the syndrome and get those questions right. Next, we'll move on to the middle, middle cerebral artery. So the symptoms are similar, except instead of the leg, it's the contralateral face and upper extremity. And if we look again at the homunculus here, so if you look at my mouse, the ACA supplies this triangle of the brain, the MCA would supply this bigger, wider triangle, which includes the face and the hands and the upper limbs. And so if you think about this red here, that's the exact same portion as this little cross section here. So it will look the same in that it's the opposite. So if I have a right MCA stroke, my fibers cross over and then my left side of my face will droop and my left limbs will be weak. So keep in mind, if you see that, that's an easy way to distinguish MCA from, from ACA. Face and upper extremity, MCA, lower extremity is ACA. And then we also have some high yield hints here. So aphasia is basically difficulties forming and either forming or um, thinking of the words you're trying to say. And in left-sided individuals, which is most people, you'll have aphasia. So if you remember here, Broca's area is sort of here in the frontal lobe and Wernicke's area is about here in the temporal lobe. So you can see that both of those regions are hit when you have an MCA stroke. So if someone has a left-sided MCA stroke, you'll probably see right-sided arm and face weakness and difficulty forming words. So they'll be either stuttering with Broca's, uh, uh, they'll be having trouble forming the words or with Wernicke's where you're just saying random words, word salad. So the cap is running through the forest and it just, it makes no sense, but they're able to form the words. Either way, that's a, an MCA stroke on the left side. But keep in mind that if an individual is either right dominant or they have a stroke on that side, I'm sorry, if, it, if it's on the right side and they're not dominant, meaning it's their non-dominant brain, which is the vast majority of people, you have hemi neglect, which means that if my stroke is on this side, on the left side of what I'm seeing, I can't comprehend. So if you put a hand and say, hey, can you see my hand? I would say, no, there's no hand there because you're basically losing the ability to perceive things on the opposite side of your brain. So let's just go through that again. The symptoms of motor and sensory will be the opposite side, face and upper extremity. And then you'll either have aphasia if the stroke is on their dominant side, which is usually the left, or you'll have hemi neglect if the stroke is on the right side. And then the last of these high yield syndromes, the posterior cerebral artery. So this one is a little trickier because it's not the classics. We've used all the limbs, so there's not an easy way to distinguish it that way. But if you think about the posterior cerebral artery here, which is towards the back, it sends blood towards the back of the brain. It supplies this back portion of the occipital lobes, which is where visual input comes in. And so if you remember, if your eyes are here, they send visual input all the way back to the posterior cerebral arteries area. And if you have a stroke on one side, so the right side PCA, the PCA supplies that portion. And so basically you'll have um, a contralateral homonymous hemianopia. Visual input light hits my eyes on this side. It hits my retina, travels back to the right side of my where the PCA is distributed. So it's a little confusing, but you'll, if you have a contralateral homonous hemianopia, so basically an opposite halves of visual loss, think of PCA strokes. But another big hint is basically if you hit the thalamus. So the thalamus is right about here, which you can see how the PCA basically sends some branches to supply the thalamus. 
So all sensory input, if you look at this picture here, all sensory input comes up from your limbs, hits the thalamus, and then goes to its respective location. So if you have stroked the thalamus, you basically have sensory loss on the entire opposite half of the body. So if I had a right-sided PCA stroke, I would have sent, I couldn't feel things on my face, I couldn't feel on my left hand, and I couldn't feel on my left leg as well. So that's another hint that they can throw in is remember that the thalamus is often supplied by the PCA. So, but remember, this is way different than an ACA or, P or MCA. There's usually not a single sort of limb weakness in sensory. It's just sensory and it's the entire other half of the body. So now we know how to tell anterior, middle, and posterior cerebral arteries apart from each other. So now let's talk about brainstem strokes and the rule of four. So the rule of four basically says that each section of the brainstem, the middle and then the lateral aspect of it, have four important structures. And if you can just remember those structures, you can be on your way to getting these questions right. So we'll start with them here and then we'll go through some examples of how to, how to answer these questions. So midline structures, so if you think about the brainstem, the middle part of the brainstem is the pictured in this, demo, this diagram here. So if you think about the medial brainstem, and then we have the lateral brainstem. So there's four midline structures and they all start with an M so it's easy to remember. You have the motor pathway or the corticospinal tract which supplies all motor to the extremities basically. You have the medial lemniscus which is the continuation of the posterior column in the spine. You have the medial longitudinal fasciculus or MLF and that basically is how you coordinate your lateral movement of your eyes and then motor nuclei and nerves. So basically cranial nerves three, four, six, and 12. And if you can just remember those four M's, you'll be on your way to keeping this straight in your head. And then there's four lateral structures and those start with an S. So spinal cerebellar pathway is responsible for basically coordinating your limbs coordination with your brain. So spino goes from your spine up to your cerebellum, which is responsible for coordination. Spinal thalamic tract which again, spine, thalamus. So it's from your spine up to your thalamus and that relays pain and temperature. And then your spinal trigeminal nucleus, which is similar to the spinal thalamic tract, but for your face. So spinal trigeminal would basically carry pain and temperature for your face. And then sympathetic or hypothalamospinal pathway, which is just basically sympathetics for um, uh, your face, basically. So if you think about, let's go through differentiating these two. If you think about the M's, you have the motor pathway and the motor nerves. So you would have motor nerves on the same side as the brainstem. And then because of your, your motor fibers cross over, you'd have motor on the opposite side of your limbs. So it's that crossed signs. So it looks like my face and then my opposite side of my body are weak. Whereas with the lateral structures here, if you think about the spinal thalamic tract, that's pain and temperature on this side and pain and temperature on the opposite side of the face. So it's an easy way if you just think about a patient or think about a practice question that comes in and you see motor on this side, motor on this side, you think M's and that's midline. If you see pain and temperature on this side, pain and temperature on this side of the body, you know that's sensory and that's lateral brainstem. So I would say that those are probably the easiest way to separate these. And then the other things, the other M's and the other S's are sort of extra information if you need it. So let's go through each region, what each region is covered. So there are four midline structures that start with an M like we talked about. And so the motor pathway controls the opposite side of the body's motor function. The medial lemniscus, which is the continuation of the posterior column, does contralateral normal sensation. So everything but pain and temperature pretty much. And then medial longitudinal fasciculus would be inability to move your eyes together to that side. And then each cranial nerve, you'd have to remember the function. It would have specific dysfunction relative to each nerve. So three, four, six, and 12, like we showed you. And then the S's spinal cerebellar is ataxia would be the symptom. Spinal thalamic tract would be opposite sided pain and temperature. And the spinal trigeminal nucleus will be same sided face and temperature, face pain and temperature loss. So again, the crossed signs, and then as well as the sympathetics are basically a Horner syndrome of the same side. So we need to keep straight that the brainstem sends off your cranial nerves as basically lower motor neurons. They're the same nerve on this side. So it'll be ipsilateral. 
but everything in the limbs crosses over in the medulla. And so everything in the limbs will be the opposite. So that's why the brainstem strokes have these cross signs where on the face, it's localizes to the exact same side of the stroke. And on the body, it crosses over and localizes to the opposite side of this stroke. So a little confusing, but if you basically look back at this slide and see, okay, I remember the M, but what does that do again? You can sort of corroborate what each function is and we can get those right. But remember the easiest way to do it is you use the motor for the cranial nerves and the motor for your body, you know, that's midline. And if it's sensory for the cranial nerves and sensory for the body, so pain and temperature, you know that it's lateral brainstem. So we can go back to this picture here and we can talk about the distribution. So remember that each region of the brain is supplied by a different blood vessel. So we have the brainstem here. So this is supposed to be, if you picture the brainstem down the middle, here are the cranial nerves, medial and lateral, and here are the blood vessels, medial and lateral. So we have a cross section. We have the midbrain, we have the pons, and then we have the medulla here. So medially, we have the PCA. So this is the posterior cerebral artery, and then it continues laterally. Medially in the pons, we have the basal artery, but the anterior, anterior inferior cerebellar or ICA continues laterally. And then in the medulla, we have the anterior spinal artery here, and then, sorry, medially, and then laterally we have the pica. So each, if you basically split the brainstem into six cross sections and draw a grid, you have six different arteries that would supply five different arteries because the PCA hits both of the midbrain regions. So that's easy. So then you also know that the brainstem, each cranial nerve nuclei is located at a specific part of the brainstem. And if you just think about it as simply as possible, this is what it looks like. In the midbrain, we just have two. We have the oculomotor and the trochlear nerve. In the pons, we have medially is cranial nerve five, the trigeminal. Laterally, we have six, seven, eight. We have abducens, we have facial, and we have vestibulocochlear. That's laterally. And then medially, we have in the medulla, we have cranial nerve 12, hypoglossal, so tongue function. And then laterally, we have 9, 10, and 11. And you can think of those as going together because it's all responsible for vocalization and basically hoarseness. And so the way I would suggest we use this, which we'll talk about in a second, is we use lateral or medial, and then we'll use the, the cranial nerve to determine the level. So I'll explain that here now. So we've talked about localizing. So we know each region of the brainstem is supplied by a blood vessel. And then we know that each region of the brainstem also has a cranial nerve. So we're basically playing pair the, pair the anatomy to get these questions right. So we'll break this down into, the, into three steps. Step one is to use the rule of four to distinguish between medial or lateral brainstem location. So we already did that. That's basically saying, if there's four Ms, you're, you're just checking the question. If there are four Ms, we're saying that's medial brainstem. If there are four Ss or two or three of the Ss, usually don't get all four of them. But if you get a couple of them and you can say, hey, I think this is lateral, you know it's, you see the four Ss, you know that it's lateral. Step two, we use the specific symptoms. So each cranial nerve that you lose, you'll get hints in the question then we localize the section. So that's the level. So midbrain, pons, medulla. So we split it into vertical first and separate medial or lateral. And then we split it into midbrain, pons, medulla, and then we can get our cross section. And then step three, once we've found our little cross section of the brainstem, we choose the vessel and we've got the question right. So that can be pretty confusing. So we'll go through a couple examples of the highest yield brainstem syndromes to talk about this and explain how to use it. And we'll go through step-by-step step exactly how I'm saying it here. So we'll start with the presentation. So a patient presents with normal facial sensation. So normal facial sensation on both sides. Weakness of the left extremities. Okay, so weakness on my left side. Vibration loss on the left side of the extremities. So that's again, left side. We know that's the, we know weakness of the left extremities is the motor pathway or corticospinal tract. We know vibration loss on this side is the, motor or is the um, medial lemniscus. So that's the second M. And so now we know we have two M's. So step one, we found the two of the four M's. So we can say, hey, this is a medial brainstem stroke. The next step we know after we've done medial or lateral is to determine the level of the lesion. Is it the midbrain? Is it the pons? Or is it the medulla? 
And so we see the only hint we have is the right eye is down and out. And we know that the motor function of the, of the eye is performed by cranial nerve three. And we know that cranial nerve three is in the midbrain. So we've done step two. We know that the cranial nerve three says it's at the midbrain. So now we've done two thirds of the problem. We know that we have a midbrain problem and we know it's the medial midbrain. So now all we have to do is say, what blood vessel supplies the medial midbrain? And we know based on the picture, if you think about a few slides ago, the picture shows that the PCA supplies the, middle, the medial midbrain. So we've basically gone from step one, medial midbrain, step two, or sorry, medial, step two is midbrain, step three, what vessel supplies that area? And we know that's the posterior cerebral artery. And so we've gone through every step of this question. We know that if they gave us what region of the brainstem is this, what level of the brainstem is this, what vessel of the brainstem is this, we know all three of those answers. And this is a high yield syndrome, also known as Weber syndrome or medial midbrain syndrome. So hopefully that makes sense. Let's go through one more. So presentation, loss of pain sensation on the right face. So we know I'm losing pain on my right side of the face. We know that is done by the spinal trigeminal nucleus, starts with an S, so that's one hint that it's an S, but let's keep reading. Falls over to one side, loss of temperature sensation in the left limbs. So I'm losing temperature on this side of my body. We know that temperature on the left side is done by the spinothalamic tract, starts with an S, we have our two S's. So we've done step one. Four S's localizes it to the lateral brainstem, and now we need to do step two. So what other hints do we have? We have drooling and we have a hoarse voice. And remember what I said, that cranial nerves nine and 10 are responsible for controlling all of the motor and hoarseness in your, and the vocalization in your throat. And so we'll say that now we know that's cranial nerves nine and 10, and we know it goes three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 is at the bottom. So we know that that should be the medulla. Cranial nerves nine, glossopharyngeal, and 10, vagus. Basically, everything going on in your throat is your medulla. And so now we've localized it to the lateral medulla. And so now the only thing we need left is step three. So step three is remembering which vessel is it that supp supplies the lateral medulla. And we remember that it is the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, or pica, is the, the artery that supplies that region. Another trick they could throw in is that the vertebral artery could potentially supply this region, but that's a lower yield fact. I would just keep in mind that the pica supplies this region. So we've gone through step one, find region, find the half. Step two is find the level. And then step three, we found the artery. And so this is another high yield syndrome called Wallenberg syndrome, also known as lateral medullary syndrome. So Again, keep in mind, these are the three steps I would use to use the rules of four. It can be really tricky, but if you separate it into medial versus lateral, and then you separate it into midbrain, pons, medulla, and then basically from there you say, which artery supplies this little grid, and we've split it up into a grid, and then from there you can get all of these brainstem stroke questions right. So brainstem strokes are confusing and so are strokes in general, but if you keep in mind these principles, you can use it as an algorithm and get these questions right on your exams. Hopefully that helps and we'll see you guys in the next one.